right of hearing is to keep it pure from listening to backbiting and listening to that to which is unlawful to listen. The right of sight. The right of sight is that you lower it before everything which is unlawful to you and that you take heed whenever you look at anything. Assalamu alaikum, dear respected viewers, and welcome to the first show of the brand new year of Live in London. And let us continue our discussion on the Rasalat al Hukuk, the great works by Imam Sajjad, the Treaty of Rights. Previously, we've discussed the rights of God, the rights of the self, the rights of the tongue. But here, Imam Sajjad discusses the right of hearing and the right of sight. Have we actually honored our two senses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with? And have we used it properly? to go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to perfect ourselves and to honor the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Let us continue our discussion with Dr. Sayyid Aman Akshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. So Sayyid, uh, you've been away for a while, you've been traveling. How are your travels? Alhamdulillah, the travels were brilliant. I uh, was on Ziyara and I think we had a live show from Karbala and then at the same time, had a wonderful experience in uh, in Pakistan, Mashallah. in Islamabad, uh, met many wonderful people. Uh, so it was all in all a very productive trip, very educational, uh, and very blessed to meet so many wonderful people. Mashallah. Yeah. Doctor, in regards to this discussion, the, the rights of hearing, the rights of, of the sight, Imam Sajjad says, you know, he's talking about uh, you know, two very important and pivotal senses that we use in our everyday lives. Generally speaking, how does hearing and viewing affect our bodies at all? Well, it's fundamental, no doubt, in the life of any human being is the ability to hear and the ability to see. As in, we know very well when one looks around them and sees somebody who, for example, is uh, blind and you realize just how blessed you are that you're able to see while others may not necessarily have that blessing. Although if you do ask some of those who are blind, mm -hmm. they'll tell you that God compensates in different ways. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that when you do see somebody who's blind or somebody who's hard of hearing, you begin to reflect on the blessings that God has given you in all your senses, but especially in relation to your hearing and your sight. I think sometimes us as human beings take these for granted. And that's why Imam Zain al-Abidin wants us to reflect on the rights that these senses have on us. That they're not to be taken for granted. Many of us will take them for granted. And many of us forget that these are really trusts of God which have been given to the human being so that we can be thankful, we become grateful, we become humble. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that when discussing our creation, he's the one who had provided us with hearing, with sight, and that we should be thankful back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having these blessings in our life. Some of us may go through months or may go through years in our life without ever saying Alhamdulillah, praising God or thanking God, shukran lillah, for being able to see or being able to hear. Some of us take these for granted. And it's only when you see, for example, a friend of yours who's gone through uh, an accident, for example, or a troublesome moment where they've lost their eyesight or they've lost their hearing that you realize just how blessed you are. So no doubt these play a pivotal role in the life of what sometimes is a very forgetful human being. You know, they say that in Arabic, when you look at the word for the human being, sometimes the word insan is used. Mm -hmm. And the question was asked, why is the word insan used in relation to the human being? And some said it's because part of that word insan, if you were to break it up, is nisyan, this forgetfulness in the human being. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to forget blessings that have been showered upon us, mm -hmm. forget those who have been generous to us. You always remember the line of Imam Ali when he says, اتقي شر من أحسنت إليه. Beware of the evil of the one you've been generous to. There are many who forget the generosity and the blessings you've shown them. And many of us forget the blessings and the generosity which Allah has bestowed upon us. And amongst these greatest blessings, no doubt, is our ability to hear and our ability to see. Yes. 
Ascent. Doctor, uh, many say that music is forbidden, um, and this probably comes to one's mind first of all when thinking about you know audios that are prohibited for a Muslim not to hear. Um, how can we, uh, you know, stop listening? And and I mean, how do we, um, you know, at weddings and stuff, you know, sometimes they actually want music to be there. It's, it's a it's a tragedy. It's a calamity sometimes. Mm. How do we address this issue? Yeah, you're absolutely right that amongst the areas in which we're all tested is our love for uh, the voice of the human and the instrumentals that surround it. I think this idea that every type of music is haram and that it's just a black and white issue and that all music is prohibited is something that we have to come to terms with is not the reality. Um, there is no way that we could say that every genre of music is prohibited in Islam or that God does not want us, for example, to use our voices to their maximum potential. There are those who are being blessed with the most wonderful voices. We find that in our traditions, the likes of Nabi Dawood were known yes. for the wonderful voices and the way that they would supplicate. And the Psalms of David, known in biblical literature, as well as within the literature of the religion of Islam, seek to highlight just how wonderful the hymns were of this prophet of God. But yes, at the same time, it seems that in Islamic tradition, one of the weapons of Satan is to ensure that there are certain genres of music or there are certain uh, instruments or that there are, for example, certain uh, even human beings who are employed to provide immoral messages, obscene messages. Mm -hmm. Now, my ear amongst its rights or my, the hearing amongst its rights, is I don't allow it to be accustomed to that which is obscene or that which is insulting. If I find myself, for example, that I'm surrounding myself with a world of musicians where the language is immoral, uh, where the language is obscene, where the language is insulting, then God did not bless me with my hearing so that my hearing is listening to uh, such words or such messages. It is sad, I believe, when the human being enjoys listening to those who are cursing and those who are obscene in their language. And whether it's you or me sitting here, we can't deny that that may have been us for a certain period of time. That we may have enjoyed a certain um, musician from the world of hip-hop, from the world of R&B, from the world of... Uh, rap, you know, even from rock and roll and jazz and so on, we may have enjoyed certain musicians whose words may have been not necessarily the message that the Quran seeks to espouse. So when you're saying, for example, that today some of us may have certain gatherings that we feel will be boring without music, yes, this is, this is true, but then we have to reflect upon ourselves that that music, has it got a major role in my life, possibly even more than the Qur'an has? Mm -hmm. How did the words of the musicians become what my hearing is accustomed to, rather than, for example, the words of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt, Now, someone says, well, these two could go hand in hand, because there are people out there <clears throat> who want music at, you know, for example, all their gatherings, but at the same time have a profound love for the Prophet Muhammad and his family. You'll find, for example, they are the type of people who are generous when it comes to the prophetic uh, message. For example, in the month of Muharram they, um, or in the month of Ramadan, they want to be amongst those who uh, sponsor, for example, the gatherings where the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt are remembered. And they'll say to you that, listen, why can't we listen to, why can't we have both? Why can't we have a period of mourning and a period of listening to, for example, such instrumentals or listening to such voices? Our reply is that the hearing that we have and I'll add the sight that we have because a lot of these music um, productions have videos associated with them they weren't meant to be accustomed to such viewing or to such listening Imam Zayn al-Abdin when writing Rasalat al-Hukuq is providing us with an understanding that 
the ears that you have or the eyes that you have, don't take them for granted. Mm. All of these, you're going to be questioned about the way that you honored them and protected them. In the Quran, many times you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention the hearing, the sight, the hearts, all of them will be questioned. I, when it comes to, for example, the question concerning music and whether the hearing of the human being or the sight of the human being should be accustomed to that world, I turn around and say, on the Day of Judgment, I've got enough issues to answer for already. Why do I want to add more? But at the same time, I don't want to make it a black and white issue where that means that every genre of music is completely forbidden in Islam. If you look at the uh, legal texts of the scholars, they'll say to you that no, there are certain types of instrumentals which are allowed. There are certain genres of music which one may listen to. And so we shouldn't have this black and white approach because I know that there are certain people who have this black and white approach that it's either my way or the highway. You either don't listen to music completely or that you are to be attacked in the, in the family or in the community. No, not at all. All we want to make the point is that the hearing and the sight are going to be questioned on the Day of Judgment. Just make sure that what you listen to and what you see, you're going to be able to answer for. Yeah. Awesome. Just a quick reminder to all the viewers that this is a live show and we are taking calls in. And if you have a question for the Sayyid, please contact us on 0203 515 -0199 And inshallah, we'll be able to answer your question. And alternatively, you can send in a WhatsApp uh, and the, the number should be at the bottom and the lower third. And inshallah, we'll be able to address your question. Said in regards to music, I mean, is it actually mentioned anywhere in the Quran that this is uh, forbidden the rules or any sort of... Um... I think even if, if it was mentioned in the Quran, I don't think that's going to stop many people. And I think that's <laughs> something interesting when people ask the question that is it mentioned in the Quran. I don't think it's going to stop many people even if there was a clear-cut verse that says, for example... Uh, music is forbidden what you have is this general message and the general message begins with the concept that we're going to question what you've listened to mm -hmm. there are no two hearts in one body and that the righteous of the believers are those who keep their hearing away from vain words awesome. if you look at chapter 23 of the holy quran surah al-mu'minun you've got allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly stating Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Qad aflah al-mu'minun. Successful are the believers. Now all of us want to have on our tombstone the word mu'min. You know, rather than Muslim, I'd rather have mu'min. Anyone can be a Muslim. It's a matter of, you know, tongue movement of seven, eight words and you become a Muslim. A mu'min is the actual application and submission to the tenets of the religion. So there's a whole chapter called Al-Mu'minun. God mentions successful are the believers. Now what's the criteria for being a mu'min? Those who display a certain level of humility within their prayer. And those who keep away from the vain words. If you feel that the music that you're listening to, the language is vain language, the language opposes that of the Holy Quran, then if you want to classify yourself amongst the mu'mineen, then you'd have to ask yourself, if the Quran is saying those who keep away, they keep away from the vain words. They don't allow their hearing to be accustomed to the world of vain words. Rather, they want their hearing to be that hearing which accustoms itself to that which allows the development and the evolution and the growth of the human spirit. You know, a recognition that there is a divine breath within us which we want to cultivate. And no one thing, there is a realization from the works of Imam Zain al Abdi alayhi salam that we have to be aware of what we hear because we need to recognize what we hear. There is a pathway to the heart of the human being. Anything we listen to, there's a pathway to the heart of the human. And therefore, when it comes to the Quran, the Quran has mentioned on numerous occasions that the believers are those who keep away from the vain words. The Ahlul Bayt, in their discussion, for example, on the world of music, 
You'll find the Ahlul Bayt السلام, look at this by saying either the effects of listening to that music which is obscene or immoral or sometimes by telling the person why don't you yourself ask yourself that this which I'm listening to is it a reflection of the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt or no? I remember Imam Sadiq السلام, on one occasion when uh, when there was this person who had come into town and Imam Sadiq asks him, where did you stay last night? And he says, I stayed at so-and-so's house. And the Imam quite interestingly replies by saying, how could you stay at this person's house? And so the, the person goes to him, what's wrong with staying at his house? And the Imam replies, in that house music is played and there are three effects. The first one, the angels do not visit that house. The second one, the supplications of the members of that house are not answered by God. And third, do not be surprised if a sudden calamity affects the members of that house. Now, the Imam here is showing the repercussions of this act. Some might look at it and say, listen, I'm not committing adultery. I'm not committing, for example, uh, murder. Yes, you're not committing these sins. There's no doubt. But still, every sin has a certain repercussion. No trial affects the life of the human being, except for a sin that they may have committed sometimes. And so on the one hand, the Ahlul Bayt want us to recognize that listening to something which is obscene or something which is immoral brings about certain trials in one's life, removes certain blessings. Imam al-Radha when he's asked the question by somebody that... You've never ever said music is halal or haram. Why? The Imam interestingly doesn't reply to him by saying music is haram. The Imam turns around to him and says to him, if I were to ask you, the musician that you listen to, these ears which God has given you, this blessing of hearing that you've been given, that person who you listen to, would you place him with the people of truth or with the people of falsehood? Is his character the character of someone of truth? Or the character of someone of falsehood. And that was enough for that person. So sometimes people, I notice, you'll find that certain people will come and sit with a Mawlana who's 60, 70 years old. Mawlana is music haram. As if that Mawlana is sitting on the internet downloading tunes 24-7. In some cases, that Mawlana hasn't got a clue about any of those tunes. He's giving a general message. And that general message is that the right of one's hearing is that you accustom it to that which is good. And that you recognize that what you hear, there is a pathway to your heart. And that there are no two hearts in one body. Ascensive. Now, in that discussion, we were talking more about the lyrics. But what about the actual music itself, musical instruments? Are these haram or are they allowed? Again, I don't think it's black and white on the musical instruments. I think that there are maraja and there are grand scholars who differ in their opinions concerning certain instruments. That there are some who will say that there are certain instruments which are completely forbidden. And that there are other instruments which like a knife, a knife can cut an orange or kill a human. And likewise, there are certain instruments that can be used in a positive way. And there are certain instruments that can be used in the negative. Uh, if you're looking at certain Islamic countries in the world today, or some that are known as Islamic states, say Saudi Arabia, for example, Pakistan, for example, Iran, for example. Clearly on the television, instruments are used. Now, the mufti or the marja of those particular countries may, for example, have their own precautionary measure about which instruments can be used, which instruments can't be used. But if you're looking at those countries, you'll find that instruments are used in many of the television and many of the film productions. So for someone out there to say that every instrument, every musical instrument is forbidden to be used. No, I think this is also contextual. I think you cannot separate law from the social milieu of the time when that law was being revealed. There are many people who will discuss law who are not good historians at all. If 
you ask somebody, for example, have you studied al al Damashqiyya? Say, yes, yes, I have. Ask him, Lum'a al Damashqiyya, when was it written? Oof. What was the context of when it was written? What's happened to the author of al al Damashqiyya, for example? They won't know. There are many who, for example, may have studied Wasail al Shia. There are many who may have studied al Kafi of uh, Sheikh al Kulaini. There are many who may have studied Man la yahdharahu al Faqih of Sheikh al Saduq. But they don't know the historical context of when these are written. Are these written in the time of the Boyids, in the time of the Seljuks, in the time of the uh, Safawids? Are they written in the time of the Mamluks? When are these works written? Who are they addressing? Is it an empire that's known for its lascivious nature, debauchery? Then maybe certain instruments which are discussed as being forbidden and that we are not allowed to listen to the music from these instruments, for example, or we're not allowed to play them. Is it maybe related to the milieu at the time where you have, for example, a, a, an empire which is indulging in obscene or forbidden That's lyrics important. even amongst the songs that they're singing or the gatherings that they're having are full of for example alcohol and so on so i think it's not black and white for a person to say okay you know what you can't listen to any type of music or that instruments for example cannot be played at all i think there is there is a major discussion to be had in terms of text and context on these issues yeah Sayyid, you've grown up in the West and I believe you're quite in touch with the youth. Why is it sometimes the youth don't, would prefer to listen to music or jump out listening to music, but they're not so keen when it comes to listening to the Quran and maybe purifying... Language barrier? And, well, Language barrier is a big thing. The Quran's mm -hmm. Arabic is, is not easy. Uh, you're looking at certain verses of the Holy Quran. There are words we don't use on an everyday basis. I remember... Many times, wherever I'd lecture in the world, people say to me, you know what, you've, you've got an advantage over us. If I'm speaking to a non-Arab community. So I'll be like, what's my advantage over you? They're like, well, you're Arab. That means that when you read the Quran, it's easier for you. Firstly, there are many non-Arabs out there whose Quranic knowledge is greater than mine. I can show you a few in Indonesia and a few in India oh, and a few in Iran who have worked tirelessly and meticulously to get accustomed to the depths of the Holy Quran. But secondly, the Arabic that's spoken in the Quran is not the Arabic that I use at home with my mom and dad, or that I use with my wife or with my siblings, for example. That's not the Quran that I use, the Arabic. The Arabic that I speak at home, slang. I'm sure if you speak Urdu, for example, yeah, you're not going to be speaking high-level Urdu at home with your parents. No, academically, no, no. There are certain Maulanas, Urdu-speaking Maulanas, or Farsi-speaking Maulanas, or Arabic-speaking Maulanas, who are known for a very high Eloquent. language when they speak, where you're sitting there thinking, hold on, I speak Urdu, but I don't know what this guy <laughs> has we... reached in terms of levels. And likewise, when it comes to the Arabic of the, of the Quran, I don't think... We have to expect our youth to have this love for listening to the Holy Quran in contrast to listening to the music of the musicians because the Arabic of the Quran is not easy for them to comprehend. Now, that's not an excuse for them as well to say, well, you know what, because I don't understand the Arabic of the Quran, I'm only going to listen to music. There's no such thing as, oh, I, you know, I need to replace it with something else. Okay, I'll replace it with anything I feel like. There has to be made an effort for a person to gain from listening to the Holy Quran, to read the translation of the Arabic of the Holy Quran. But I think also, maybe sometimes the message in some of the works of the musicians may relate to their life a bit more. I don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us to leave our houses like zombies with Qurans in our, in our phones, walking in the streets, listening to them 24-7. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wasn't interested just in those who try and memorize, but rather those who reflect upon the Quran, contemplate upon the Quran. When some people are listening to the words of the musicians, and if you look at some of the, the great musicians out there who had certain lyrics with meaning, okay. 
person can look at that and say, that relates to me. But a person who's not contemplating on the Qur'an at all or reflecting on the Qur'an will never see what is there that may relate to them, even though there is so much that relates. You have, for example, certain tests in your relationship with people, for example. Then you look at the test the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family had. You have, for example, a trial in your marriage. Then within the Holy Quran, you can see a trial in the marriage of Nabi Nuh or Nabi Lut. For example, you want to get married to somebody, but you're not sure how to go about it. You could see what happens with, for example, Moses and the daughter of Shu'aib. You have a family issue. You can go to Adam, Habil, and Qabil. There are many stories within the Holy Quran that can relate to our life, but it does require an effort to try and contemplate on them. Then with that contemplation, there'll be more of a fervor to want to listen to the Holy Quran. Yeah. Ahsan, Sayyid. Sayyid, one would argue that, you know, we can listen to Nasheeds and Latmiyat, but Nasheeds and Latmiyat, they have a similar origin to music. They have a similar effect on the body as well. Um, I mean, who decides and how do we decide that, okay, this form of audio is acceptable and the other isn't? I must admit, barring the obvious criterion, which is, you know, and, and it's that which the content is obscene or immoral. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need the jurors to tell you. I think sometimes the second level of criteria or the second barometer that is normally given legally is that that which you're listening to would not be played, would, would for example, be the type of thing or the type of um, tune that would be played, for example, at a club okay. or at an immoral gathering. If it is the okay. type of tune that would be played at a nightclub or at an immoral, a place of immoral gathering, let's say, then it becomes forbidden to listen to it. Agreed. Um, with some of these nasheeds, for example, I don't know, I, I'm not really one who's an avid follower of, of the latest nasheeds, but sometimes, for example, you look at some of the the beautiful work of someone like uh, Sami Yusuf, for example. Um, I remember hearing uh, one of the productions of Sami Yusuf talking about, you know, there being a, a river in, in heaven uh, for Imam Ali and Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. I don't think that's going to be played at, at a club in, in, in Saint-Tropez or, uh, or at a club in, uh, in Vegas anytime soon. And I, I think likewise, when you're listening to, for example, Mullah Basim al-Karbala'i, and you're seeing some of the nasheeds that he has, um, you know, let's say praising Imam Ali, I can't see that being played, you know, at a club in, in Chelsea or Mayfair anytime soon. Um, although stranger things have happened. So when you're, when you're looking at that, I think the criteria would be, as long as what you're listening to is not something that would be played at an immoral gathering. That would be the second criteria. The first would be, that the words don't oppose the Qur'an or the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam. Ahsan Sayyid, Ahsan Tom. Backbiting uh, is an, uh, a big issue. Now, if, if you allow me to uh, recite the, the Treaty of Rights on, on Hearing, the right of hearing is to keep it pure from listening to backbiting. Imam Sajjad straight away kind of attacks backbiting. Um, why is it that our community enjoys it? Sees it as a good time pass, entertaining. Maybe it's an ego issue of getting one over the other. Why, why, why does our community consider to have this as a problem? And could you please remind us of how Islam, how serious Islam treats backbiting and its punishments? That, well, I, I think Islam treats backbiting in one way, but slandering in another. And slandering is worse than backbiting. You know. I sometimes find that it's actually the more religious people who are backbiters, not the less religious. Because the more religious have a way of justifying their backbiting religiously. We have in, 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 in Iraq and even in the Middle East, before we want to backbite someone, we say something. May God not make this ghiba and then we launch the attack. What Masha happens Allah. there is that we figured out a loophole, which is that God, don't make this a ghibah, but 
full-out attack. And I sometimes find that even within our communities, even until, uh, until a couple of days ago, someone was showing me that there is a clip being spread about me that said Ammar said this and said Ammar said that. And most of these people who send these clips around to try and, you know, defame you, if that can even be done, you know, with such clips um, or attack you, uh, most of these people are people who view themselves as uh, soldiers of God. I don't think it's the, the, the less religious people. I think the ones who aren't so religious, I'm, you know, I use this term religious, I'm still trying to understand the definition of it, but that will come to another day. Uh, it's a skewed definition that the religious give to the word religious. But I agree. those people sincerely believe that they are soldiers of God. What they'll do is they'll backbite. Backbite means I'll tell the truth about someone, but knowing that they don't want that said about them. And then they'll go to an even higher level, which is slandering. And slandering is when you blatantly know that you're saying something about someone which is a lie, but your intention and your aim is to defame that person for a greater good. We have people who dress like Maulanas, and they would actually go around to youth around the world saying, defame character A, character B, character C. And if you have to lie about them, then lie about them. Because for the greater cause, it's worth it. That person has not understood the right of hearing in Islam. That in Islam, I should never allow these ears to welcome backbiting. Meaning, for example, now someone's coming to you, Sayyid Muhsin says, did you hear this about Sayyid Amman Akshawani, for example? You've got two options there. You either could turn around and say, you know what, bro? He's not here. When he comes here, you say it in front of him. And I think that's when many people change their minds. But because most, there are a lot of people out there who, in front of you, they're smiling. They, are, they probably stabbed you in the back 24 million times. But in front of you, Salam, Sayyidina, I love you, this, that. But you know, it's full of stabs. Now, or you could turn around and you could listen to what they're saying. Sometimes the person backbiting, is a troublemaker. But there's also the ones who have forgotten the right of their ears. And that is, I shouldn't be allowing this to come to my ears. God did not give me these ears. Did not give me the ability to hear. So I listen to negative vibes and jabs against people's characters. You know, in certain parts of the world, there are actually magazines which are dedicated to backbiting and to slandering. You know, if you... You look at these Hollywood stars. Amazing. There are magazines that Amazing. have destroyed marriages. There are newspapers in this country that hacked people's phones and ended up exposing their private lives. When a person asks me about Islam, I turn to many a non-Muslim out there and I'm like, you know what? You whose reputation got destroyed, you who the tabloids or the broadsheets ripped apart their personal life. Come and look at what Islam says about backbiting. Islam says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in chapter 49 of the Holy Quran, which is a chapter, anyone out there who wants to know what the core message of morals in Islam is, just read chapter 49 of the Quran. And there is this one ayah in chapter 49, one verse, Do not backbite one another. Do you like to eat the dead flesh of your brother? It's something that disgusts you. Indeed. But you're behind someone's back and you're ripping them to pieces. And then when you see them, Salamu alaykum, Mawlana. How are you? How's it? Wallah, I love you. I, deep down, you are full of hate. And that's the beauty about the hearing, sight, combination in Islam and in the Quran. How many times do you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts hearing and sight next to each other in the Quran? For example, خَتَمَ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Allah in the Quran says, a seal has been placed over them. 
Over their hearts? Over their ears. And over their eyes. eyes. Look how the ears and eyes close to each other. Mm -hmm. We'll ask you about your heart and about your ears and about your eyes. And it's as if we are being told these aren't just physical entities. They have a bearing on your spiritual growth. What you allow to come into your hearing and what you allow your eyes to see, either see you become higher than an angel or lower than an animal. Because we know very well, animal, emotion, no intellect. Angel, intellect, no emotion. No emotion. Human being, intellect and emotion. That means if the human being is able to master their senses, they become higher than the angel. angel. If the human being allows what's around them to dictate what they should see, what they listen to, many, many of the things that people listen to and what many of the things people watch are from peer pressure. If you look, for example, people listening to music, I guarantee you there are people out there who listen to music just to keep up with their peers at school because they're not going to be part of that cool conversation when it comes to who knows what the latest, you know. Understood. Likewise, when it comes to, for example, the peer pressure, there are certain things that you are told, look at that because of your peers. If you as a human being can turn around and say, hold on, God gave me the blessings of hearing and sight, not so that you dictate to me what I hear and what I see, but rather that which is beneficial is what I listen to. Why do we, for example, in our community, stress on listening or watching majalis? Why? So many things to watch on TV. So many wonderful things to watch on TV. So but, much rubbish is well. <laughs> But that, is it allowing my growth or not? Indeed. Majalis al Hussein alayhi salam, what are they? But a university. Indeed. Which allows for my growth. What is the wasila? What's the intermediary in that growth? My hearing and my sight. sight. Listening to the majlis. Some people on their way to work, one hour, doing nothing in the car. Some people put majlis in the car. Education, growth. I'm allowing myself before I go to work to listen to something. Likewise, some of us know we're sitting at home, we can watch anything, we put a majlis, either on YouTube or on the television. It doesn't only have to be religious. It could be something about the world of nature, world, the world of science, the world of economics, the world of politics. But I have to always ask myself, that which I'm hearing, that which I'm seeing has a bearing on my growth as a human being is it taking me to the angelic and higher or is it taking me to the animalistic and lower yeah Ascent. and just for the viewers sake could you please remind us about the punishments of uh, backbiting i mean how severe it is and how uh, i mean specifically what's been mentioned with the hadith and with the quran well i'm not really interested in talking about punishment so much in all honesty um you know i, I think we've heard enough punishment lectures <laughs> for years for me to then start talking about, well, you know what, you're going to be placed on some, I don't know, some Hot crane somewhere with molten lead and lava. I'm not, I rather believe the human being at any moment in their life can have a switch, can have a spark, can have a change. I don't want to be that person who sits here and says, oh, you who backbite, there will be molten lead and brass and petrol and gas and unleaded and everything will be in your ears and in your mouths. I don't want to go down that route. God has made it clear enough that don't backbite one another. you ripping the flesh and the dead flesh of your brother. That should be enough for a person. Ascent. Say we've discussed backbiting, we've discussed music. Are there any other prohibitions in, in terms of hearing in Islam that pe people may not be aware of? Well, I don't think there's any other prohibitions as such. These are the main, you know, if, if you're talking about prohibitions, then you're talking about that which is obscene or immoral. Yeah. Ascent, doctor. If you allow me, we need to go to a break. Sure. So to the viewers, please continue to watch us uh, after the break and continue with this discussion on hearing and seeing. Inshallah, we'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to Live in London where we were discussing the rights of hearing and the rights of seeing from Rasat al Hukuk, the Treaty of Rights by Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. Doctor, Islam sometimes is attacked for restricting women from being uh, open, being, uh, speaking. Does Islam actually restrict from women being heard for their rights, for their opinions? Yeah, culture restricts them, not Islam. And because we have a lot of leaders in our community who want to impose the way they were raised on the way everybody else should live, that means that women in some cases will not get a word in edgeways. It's not the religion of Islam that's the issue. It's that sometimes the patriarchal leadership has never ever envisaged that a woman should be part of the community's political decision making, that a woman should be involved in religious discussion. And what they've done quite cleverly is place Sayyida Fatima and Sayyida Zainab as the token examples, but they'll never want to apply them. Either not apply them because they'll say, well, that was a reactionary situation. It wasn't the norm. That Sayyidah Fatima said, Zainab would otherwise never give lectures. It was just because it called for that. Or they'll turn around and say, well, you know, we give these examples in public if people tell us that Islam is against women. But they themselves, if for example, a lady wants to give a lecture in the community, they themselves will all of a sudden start bringing their own patriarchal worldview and not allow the woman's voice to be heard. I've been to events where when the Muslim woman is giving the talk, you know, I do something on purpose when I'm at an event and normally they'll give me, let's say, the main table. There's a couple of things that I've done on purpose in the past. Firstly, I'll sit on any table anywhere. And sometimes the organizers, oh, come here, come there. No, no, no I'm, I'm fine where I am. Let me just chill here. And then secondly, if I am taken to the front table, I always find that people on the front table have this sad behavioral pattern where they don't mind having their back facing the person giving the talk okay. so for example you'll see that this front table full of supposed scholars you know a panel no no the front table i'm saying say there is a stage and that there is uh, uh, tables everywhere normally the one closest okay. to the stage is is made up of people who uh -huh. you know supposedly are scholars and You've got to give them benefit of the doubt. It's probably a day out for them. And, and what happens is that when, we, when someone goes up to give a talk, these guys will not turn around. So imagine if I'm, if I'm giving a talk and imagine you've got your back facing me. I'm imagine I'm about to start the talk. You turn around, wouldn't you? I would. But you'll find that there are some who won't turn around. Now, especially sometimes when the woman in our community give a talk, you'll find that there are people who find it normal that this lady is trying to speak for about 20, 25 minutes and they'll have their back facing her comfortably. When someone says, therefore, are our woman being heard? I think the culture doesn't allow, but the religion does. But that's not to say that there aren't centers and organizations who are making an effort to try and resolve this yeah so are we actually allowed to visit uh, a majlis where a woman is actually why not a men as well are why not to... why not what's the woman doing up there mm -hmm. the woman's giving us lecture about the quran and the ahlul bayt alayhi salam going to any lecture 70 percent of that attendance of that lecture is about your attitude and 30% is about your intellect. You want to go to a place where you want to learn, 70% of it is your attitude when you enter that place. I don't care if it's a man or woman, they give a presentation, I want to listen. 
We make it sound like that this lady who's gone up to give a lecture is all of a sudden going to start, I don't know, take her hijab and start dancing in front of us or something. So are we allowed in Islam to listen to her? Of course we're allowed to listen to her. What's the issue? And someone says, but Mawlana so-and-so says that you're not so... Well, maybe Mawlana sitting where he sits has probably never seen a lady without, with her face showing except his wife. Whereas there are many contexts where there is no harm in this. So yes, there's no problem. I would be honored if there is someone giving a lecture about a certain topic in Rajiv Islam. I'd be honored to come and sit and listen to that lecture. I don't care about the agenda. Yeah. Well said then. Thank you for clarifying that. So yeah, just a quick reminder to all the viewers that this is a live show and if you have any questions you'd like to direct towards the Sayyid, please contact, contact us on 0203 515 If not, alternatively, you can send your question in via WhatsApp and we'll do our best to answer them. Say so, now with your permission, let's continue the discussion on towards sight. Um, there are unfortunately people who are born blind. Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually chosen for them not to have sight? Is, is it... Um, why are they born with blind? Well, medically speaking, I'm no one to comment on why someone's born blind. But all of us, are, I suppose, are given a test in one way. And some of them may see it as a blessing in the other. Let me explain. A test in the sense that some of us are tested with our health. Some are tested with our wealth. Some are tested with our children. Some are tested with the loss of life. And so this no doubt is a test. It does mean that there are certain obligations which will not, for example, be compulsory on them, which may be compulsory on us and so on. But on the other hand, there are those who are blind, but they will turn around and say, while my heart is not blind, then I've been blessed by God. That's it. Doctor, I believe we have a caller on the line and with your permission, we'll try and answer the call. Salaamu Alaikum, brother, sister, your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum, we can hear you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I don't think they can hear us. Technical team, if you can get, get back in contact with uh, that viewer, and inshallah, we'll be able to answer the viewer's question. There so are those who will turn around to you and say that I'm honored that God gave me sight in my heart. And I, I think that there are many profound personalities who have said that line. I remember a story where Prophet Jesus, السلام, the Prophet Isa, asks God a question. He says to him, which servant of yours, which creation of yours do you love the most, is the most thankful for your blessings? He said to him, there's a lady at the end of your road. She's the most thankful for what I've given her. The Prophet Jesus السلام, begins to walk towards the end of his road. He gets close to this lady. He notices she's got no feet. He gets closer. Notices she has no hands. He gets even closer. Notices she's blind. Now he's wondering, hold on. I said to God, who is your greatest creation? And he said, there's this lady at the end of your road who's so thankful for what I've given her. But now I notice that there is this lady in front of me and she's got no hands, no feet. Me and you would complain. She's blind. So he said to her, may I ask you a question? Are you grateful for what you've been through? She goes, how can I not be grateful to God? He says, so what do you mean? She says, how can I not thank the Lord who did not give me the feet that may walk towards that which is haram? Or the hands that may touch haram. Or the eyes that may look towards haram. What a generous Lord this is. There are some of us with what we've looked at in our life. It's going to be a long day of judgment for us. That blind man or that blind woman will say, Sorry guys, you guys have got quite a few things to answer for. Me and you will be shown certain clips of what we allowed these eyes to see. So who is more blessed? And what type of sight does a person want in their life? The sight of the eyes or the sight of the heart? Beautiful. Yeah.
Doctor, you were mentioning uh, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam there, and what is the difference between Ikma and Atma in, ter- in, in, in regards to Hazrat Jesus, uh, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam? I mean, Ikma and Atma. Both are translated in English as blind. Yes. Akma means physically blind. A'ma can be physical blindness and blindness of the heart. So when the Quran mentions Christ, it says he can give sight back towards those who are blind. blind. Yes, we believe this. The Christian religion believes this as well. The word akma is used. Akma is when you're talking of someone who is physically blind. A'ma can refer to you being physically blind but also spiritually blind. MashaAllah. Yeah. And what about uh, Basira and um, Basar, as in both mean sight? What's the difference between that? Basar, for example, is referring to your physical uh, eyesight, yes, to see something. Uh-huh. Basira is referring to insight. So if you imagine, there are people who have outside. I could see what's in front of me, I see cameras. I see television screen, I see you in front of me, yes, with my basar. Basira is insight, where I can see past the layers that surround me. I move from the world of knowledge to the world of wisdom, from the world of ilm to the world of hikmah. And that's the difference between basar and basira. I'm sorry, for, thank you, doctor. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those who are blind in the dunya will also be blind in the hereafter. <coughs> now one could argue, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have against blind people? <coughs> I mean, what sort of justice is this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Those who are blind in this world will be blind in the hereafter does not refer to those who are physically blind. See, there's interesting discussion. The verses of the Holy Quran, are they open for ta'wil or not? Some schools said in Islamic theology, you cannot interpret you only take what literally is written for example if the quran says do not say to your parents off we are told that you can't even say off to your parents off some schools in islam said off represents don't tut don't be rude don't be Mm -hmm. abrasive other schools said no. If Allah says فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْفٍ That means any other word you call your parents you can. Just don't say off. So if I now turn around to my parents and I say to them for example You people are cowards. I hate you. That school says you can say that. No problem. Say why? Say because the Quran says don't say off. So as long as you don't say the word off There's no issue. So no, no, no. Off is metaphorical for not being Rude. Had there been a word smaller than off, it would have been used. Likewise, when it came to this verse, those who are blind in this world will be blind hereafter. You're absolutely right. Someone could turn around and say, hold on a minute. First, you guys discuss the right of sight. I don't even have sight. And then the Quran mentions that those who are blind in this world will be blind hereafter. What have I done wrong to be blind? I want to also go to heaven and see the lakes and see the rivers and see everything else that's around the lakes and the rivers. When you go to heaven, I want to be in that world as well. We reply by saying, no, those who are blind in this world, meaning those who have not found the truth, fight the truth, don't want an interest in the truth, will also be blinded away from the truth in the hereafter. I remember there was one mufti in Saudi Arabia who tried to debate one of our scholars saying that you Shia do tafsir and ta'wil of the Holy Quran. And you say that there are these verses that can be interpreted in different layers. This is not allowed. And you people, you Shia, the people of Bid'ah and people of Kufr and people of Shirk. So our Mawlana looked at him and he said to him, I want to ask you a question because the Mufti was blind. He said to him, so every verse in the Quran you take literally. He said, yeah, every verse we take literally. He said, so... The ayah says that those who are blind in this world will be blind in the hereafter. What do you say about that? He goes, no, 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 that means blind in the heart. So he goes, now who's doing ta'wil of the Quran? Me or you? Yeah. So when it comes to such an ayah of the Holy Quran, those who thought this is God being anti-blind, no. 
blindness of the heart, like we said, the difference between basa and basira. Likewise, there is a difference between blindness of the heart and the physical blindness. Yeah. Doctor, are there any famous blind people that have inspired you in, in terms of Islamic history or narrative? Well, it, probably one of the greatest narrators of tradition in, in, in the Shia school who was blind, but he was given the title of the father of the visionaries oh, wow. is Abu Basir. How many times you read a hadith? Basir. Abu Basir narrates from Imam Assad. How many yes. times have you read? Yeah, Ask times. anyone who has read the books of the school of Ahlul Bayt and they'll say to you, you'll always come across a tradition. Abu Basir, Abu Basir. Abu, Abu Basir was blind. Abu Basir was blind. blind. But what did he have? He had the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Once you have that, are you blind? You have the most light in you. Maybe blind here, but you know what? If I've got sight with my heart, I've got insight, I've got basira, there is no better gift to be given. There are many personalities who their blindness did not affect what was in some cases the sharpest minds, you know. Ibn Abbas, for example, blind at the end of his life, but unbelievable number of traditions narrated. You look at, for example, if, if you look one of the most famous lecturers in Egypt um, of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, Sheikh Abdul Hamid Kishk, phenomenal lecturer, memorized the Quran, memorized traditions, has one of the greatest lectures I've personally ever heard on Imam al-Hussein on the 10th of Muharram. And he was blind. And so you have personalities in history, their blindness didn't affect their memorization of the Quran, their blindness didn't affect their memorization of tradition, their blindness did not, for example, uh, affect their narration of traditions as well. And these are people to definitely learn from. Yeah. Dr. Weber, call on the line and uh, let's cross our fingers and inshallah we'll be able to get through to them. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Hello, assalamu alaikum. Technical team, if you could please uh, try and call the caller back and inshallah I'll be able to get through to them. Sorry, doctor, as you were saying. Yeah, so these are personalities we've been inspired by. Doctor, there is a famous uh, saying or rule, let's say, the rule of thumb in our community, which is in, to do with, uh, in regards to sight that one glance is uh, allowed or permissible. Or some people try and take advantage of this one glance or this one stare. How do we address this? What do we say to p these people? Just make sure that, you know, you, you have good neck movements and keep, <laughs> keep turning as that, uh, as that one look continues. Because you've got that, you know, you always have someone in the community who will say, well, if one looks allowed, then this was my one look. And, well, th that wasn't really the, the intention behind it. You know, one look is understandable. But then after that, you have that consciousness of God. And it's not easy. Why should I sit here and pretend that I'm, you know, God's gift on earth? At the end, there many of us have fallen uh, with what we thought was one look, and then we needed a second look just to make sure, for <laughs> example. But a person of taqwa will be someone who'll try and um, ensure that you know what my eyes. I know very well that I'm going that they that I'm going to be questioned about what I've seen. Also, at the same time, there is a delicate spiritual point. If I believe the Imam of my time is alive, is it that I don't see him because I don't want to see him? No, I want to see him. Is it that I don't see him because he's not next to me? No, he's next to me. Sometimes these eyes that have accumulated so much sin, maybe that's the reason I can't see purity. And so sometimes, testing yourself with these battles of the one look and so on, maybe that might have an instrumental effect on being able to see the Imam of your time one day. Beautiful, Doctor. Very touching. Doctor, the technical team have told me that they fixed the problem and inshallah we'll be able to get through to our caller. Assalamu alaikum. Your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Raza Khan and I'm calling from Dublin. Uh, salam to Sayyid Amar and to you, Sayyid Mawson. Thank you very much. Uh, salam alaikum. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, I would like to say to say the more that we are blessed to have him, such a prolific scholar, and it's amazing that the work that he is doing for the community yeah. of uh, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, the question I have to say the more is that about uh, uh, with regards to Sufi music, um, there's always this consensus that Sufi music, according to many scholars of uh, uh, the school of Ahl-Bayt, it is somewhat permissible. Uh, but I don't seem to get my head around it that the usage of the name of Imam Ali uh, uh, repeatedly with music sends you in a state of trance. So I just want to, wanted your opinion on this, if you could kindly explain to me uh, what, is, what, do we, uh, what, do, what do Shia school of thought says about Sufi music. Thank you very much, brother. Yeah, I think in the Indo-Pak subcontinent, there is a genre of music which is known as Kawali. Yes. And amongst the lyrics is a, is a phenomenal love for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. Indeed. I think anything in moderation is acceptable. <clears throat> the brother's talking about such type of music which brings you to a trance. We don't want that music to be what our ears are accustomed to. Rather, that poetry, which brings you closer to God and the Prophet and his family, there is no harm there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Doctor. Doctor, in the West, mm. I mean, we're, we, have, we have conversations with loads of people, whether it's interviews at work, whether it's colleagues uh, at school. And you and I both know it is a custom to look at the person uh, while you're speaking to them. But at the same time, Islam tells us to lower our gaze. In the West, sometimes this is seen as actually rude to uh, be looking down and, and not speaking to the individual as if they're not... No, no, look at the individual, no problem. Yes. Look at the custom of your time. What's the orf? Mm -hmm. There's no issue. I've gone to a university interview. There's a professor in front of me. Uh, there's no harm. Continue a conversation. No lustful intention there. You're going in, you're having a discussion about education. There's no harm. Islam says, for example, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ this is lowering their gaze, keeping it away from, you know, lustful, uh, harmful uh, intentions and actions. Otherwise, you're going for an interview at work. There's no issues there at all. Thank you very much. We have another caller on the line. Inshallah, we're able to get through to them. Assalamu alaikum. Your name, where are you calling from? Yeah, assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Hassan. I'm calling from Australia. Um, uh, my question is, uh, does any of the Imams compare backbiting to any of the common major things? Like, for example, if we give an example, you have Imam Jafar al sadiq He says, he says, for example, the Tasbih of Fatima al Zahra is better than a thousand rakhats after the uh, Wajib Salah. Yeah, there, there, there are numerous traditions of comparison or of the effects of backbiting. And I think the great scholar Dastareib in his book, The Greatest Sins, there is a chapter on backbiting and he lists all of the traditions of the Ahl al-Bayt about backbiting and what it's compared to. That would be the best reference for all of these traditions of comparison. Thank you very much, Sayyid. Sayyid, I think it's a very, uh, it may be a bit of a taboo topic, but I think it's very important is that there is an issue, an epidemic as such, in our community of watching indecency or uh, immoral uh, videos and images. How do we tackle this issue as a community? Um, how do we stop people from falling into such a sin? Even the prophets of God went through trials with the sexual energy of the human being. If you look, for example, at the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, you know, a prophet of God is faced with a major trial and that is the wife of someone who's employed him wanting to have a physical relationship with him. And one wonders why does God actually show us the scene of Zuleikha and Yusuf? And really what God's highlighting to us is one of the most important as well as possibly pivotal desires in the life of the human being is their sexual desires. 
And the human being wants to look at that which is sexually pleasing to the eye. The right of your sight is that you don't allow it to become accustomed to that which is obscene or immoral. But we're all going to go through a frantic hormone period where our hormones are raging, where we see bodily changes, and where we want to view images which hither to this point either we haven't viewed or are very difficult to get to. Now, animals have sex and we have sex, and animals eat and we eat, and animals sleep and we sleep. But the human being, what differentiates them from every animal on this earth is discipline, dignity, honor, humility. These are what differentiates the human from even that which 99% is similar to it in DNA. And so, in our communities, if there is this pornography, for example, issue that exists, it's not something new, but it has to be discussed. There has to be an arena where people who have faced an addiction to pornography and have overcome it, remember, this doesn't just affect Muslims. There are many non-Muslims out there who are so addicted to porn to the extent that some statistics say to us that these eyes that God gave the human being as a blessing are eyes which look at the internet on a regular basis and 60% of the internet is porn. That much. And so when that statistic tells us that it's a major test to honor and observe the rights, the haq of one's eyes, because you've got this ability and this freedom to go online go to websites for free okay in the 80s or in the 70s people had to go and buy videos and so if you're if you've ever traveled in in america or even in the uk you'll find that a lot of these places which sell pornography are in the middle of a highway junction in the middle of nowhere Okay. And it would say, for example, let's say that this is a, a, a sex shop and anybody is allowed to come inside. And then there were certain streets which were meant to be sex streets where you could go in and watch a porn film or go to porn cinemas. Now it's so readily available that unless our scholars address this openly, the way our imams addressed it openly. Wasa'il al-Shia of al-Hur al-Amali has a chapter called the Book of Nikah. If you look at that chapter, how Imam al-Sadiq <coughs> alayhi salam and Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, how they openly discuss sexual positions, how they openly discuss, and you know, in a couple of uh, shows, we're going to have the rights of the private parts. Mm-hmm. And I'll elaborate on this further. But you've got this ability in this day and age to actually use your eyes to watch porn for free. It goes to show you that you think these eyes have no effect on your spirituality. They could destroy or they can make or they can allow growth. So we need to be a a lot more open in our mosques and have a lot more counselors who are willing to hear out people who face a pornography addiction, for example, their life. Thank you, Doctor. We have a caller on the line. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Wa Alaikum Salaam. Um, my salams obviously go to my two dear brothers, uh, Sayyid Amun Akhwani and Sayyid Mohsin. Thank, Thank you. you. Firstly, it's a very good show that you guys have actually put on. Thank you. And um, my question to you guys is that how do we go about in the 21st century about tackling these problems um, in a, te- a technological way? Okay, can, can, you be a bit, uh, can you give us more detail to your question? How do you mean by technological? So, I mean, obviously technology is progressing into a manner where we've got like um, artificial intelligence coming in, such okay. as like the Sophia. Obviously, people actually becoming deluded into this uh, pathway, which is away from religion. So, what mechanisms can be used to bring people back to the religion? And what should we be doing as the 
Okay. I don't think Islam wants us to view science negatively. I think Islam on the contrary says that scientific progress should be appreciated, should be lauded, um, and should be supported. And I think using technology to, uh, to be able to spread the word of the Qur'an and the word of the Ahlul Bayt is something fundamental. Uh, I do believe that we are behind as a community technologically. But I do at the same time believe that some of our younger generation is making great strides. So look at what the current trends are in the world of technology. What is happening in the world of apps? What's happening in the world of chat? What's happening yes. in the world of pictures? And try your hardest to find ways of incorporating the religious message on there. Religion doesn't just have to be, you know, confined to the mosque or confined to majalis or confined to <coughs> the seminaries. There are different ways in which a person is able to promulgate religion in their time. Very insightful. Thank you, Doctor. We have another caller on the line. Sure. And inshallah, we'll be able to answer the question. Assalamu alaikum. Your name and where you're calling from? Uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Minhal Khafaji. I'm calling from London. Um, my question is, um, how do you explain to someone that um, does, for example, backbiting, who watches these horrendous things, how do you explain to them that this is ro morally wrong without causing conflict? And how do you, for example, you know, because some people come up with these views, oh, I'm just learning, I'm just going through a stage. How do you explain to them without causing tension? Okay, thank you very much. Doctor. I think one, one of the best ways is to tell the person, would you like it if someone spoke behind your back? You know, mm -hmm. I think it's a simple line, but it affects many of us. Now, when you tell someone, listen, bro, stop backbiting. Would you like yeah. it if someone spoke behind your back or revealed something about your life? And sometimes the person may not accept it there and then. They'll mull over it on their way home. And this is something very important to realize that the human being's ego doesn't allow them there and then to say, yeah, you're right. Well, on their way home, that night after having had dinner with you or after having had a discussion with you, they'd say, you know, he had a point. Mm -hmm. I don't say that backbiting is something that can be deleted in one day. It requires a major struggle. It's a jihad of the nafs of the human. The human being wants to hear people's lives ruined and destroyed. It's a struggle, but I think it requires patience even with the backbiter. Doctor, we have another caller on the sure, line. Go ahead. We'll try and get the question in. Salaamu Alaikum, your name and your question, please, to the doctor. Hello, Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Your name and where you're calling from? Uh, my name is Ammar Benin. I'm Mashallah. calling from Leicester. Mashallah. Your uh, question for the doctor, please. Um, Sayyid, I'm yes. trying to memorize the Holy Quran. And I was wondering if there was any advice or tips that you might give me to make it easier for me. Thank you very much sure. for your question. Hip it's off. a great question and you know it's, it's great to hear members of our community who are eager to memorize the Holy Quran. It doesn't happen very often that you hear people <laughs> who want to memorize the, the verses of the Quran. I would definitely say if you can find someone who's a mentor or someone who you can buffer your memorizing with. You know, in, in, the, in the Islamic seminary or in the Hawza, Mubahatha is a fundamental yes. um, aspect. If you're able to, for example, discuss with someone your findings, this is something fundamental and something of the utmost importance. I think likewise, when you memorize the Quran, it's always great to have someone there who's alongside you. You know, on a trivial level, you go to the gym, you want a gym buddy. Mm -hmm. you can still go to the gym alone, yes. but that body encourages you, supports you, support each other. I think likewise with memorization of the Holy Quran, I think having someone who is there as a mentor or as a teacher or as a partner, I think that's something which hopefully will be beneficial to the system. Definitely. Another call on the line, Doctor. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Yes, wa alaikum as salam. This is Agha Shabir from New Jersey. Oh, wow, New Jersey. Uh, today is... Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day in the United States. Okay. So can you please speak on the issue of racism and also be as a debate understood it? <coughs> and how do we look at others without eyes? Thank you very much for your question, Dr. Martin Luther King. Yes, thank you, Agha Shabir and Salams to everybody in New Jersey, all of our beloved brothers and sisters over there. And today is Martin Luther King Day in the United States. 
And having lived in the United States for a number of years, it really is a great day and a, at an important time. I think also today we saw the passing away of one of the one of the icons of British football, Cyril Regis. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if um, you remember Cyril Regis, but in I don't. in my time, certainly when I was younger, I remember Cyril Regis having a major role in the removal of racism and standing up against racism and encouraging many black football players, for example, to come through. You know, when later on you saw uh, famous black football players um, playing in British football, such as Ian Wright, John Barnes, John Barnes Stan Collymore, Stan Collymore, Thierry Henry, Henry and later on, you know, these were inspired and a lot took a lot wanted to give credit to someone like Cyril Regis who passed away today and our condolences go towards uh, the Regis family and I think therefore it's very important for us on a day like this to recognize that sadly that racism still exists and it sadly still exists within our own communities you know in our own communities a lot of our brethren from an African background are still not treated with the respect they deserve, are still in some cases humiliated. And I think it's vital for us to realize the Ahlul Bayt السلام, firstly had a love for those who came from Africa to the extent many married from Africa. To the extent that the likes of Sayyidah Fidda, for example, if she's of an African origin, some say of an Indian origin, there's difference of opinion. Or there are others such as John of Abyssinia who are honored companions. Likewise, anyone who has a mustard seed weight of racism and prejudice will be raised with the people of Jahili on the Day of Judgment. So I think it's a, it's a fitting day to remember just how important the campaign's anti-racism are and how much they should be supported. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, just for the viewers out there, um, we do have... Um we do have some more time and if you'd like to call in and squeeze in your questions um, call us on 0203 515 0199 and the doctor inshallah will be able to answer them for you but before that doctor uh, can we read some questions that have been sent in sure, um, I've got a good one here um, it's talking about going to the seaside and to the beach I mean this is a great western uh, um, uh, tradition that you are going to be exposed to indecency at the beach is it wise for a Muslim to go on a nice sunny day to Margate or South End Forget Margate like There are other beaches Which I'm just thinking of now Where we've had a You know you have a struggle When you're going there To that You know to that beach And you look one way And look the other And And there isn't You know much clothing And then you begin to ask yourself Should I really be here And I think there's a line That the human being Has to draw at some point mm -hmm. You know uh, While the religion of Islam Is not a religion That wants to Remove you away From enjoying yourself There are points Where the religion says there is a line that you must be drawing where you say, no, this is not the place for us. Another question here to do with uh, the taboo topic we're talking about of indecency. Um, what do you recommend for an individual to wheel him off this sin and, and, and exercise this to help him refrain from sinning like this? Make sure they don't stay idle. You know, idle, uh, idle time mm -hmm. can be a real, real poison in the life of the human being. Keep yourself busy. Um, and I think the parents also have to be up to date with what's happening in the, in the world of technology and up to date with, you know, their, their sons or their daughters relationship. Imam Ali, alayhi salam, tells Imam al-Hassan that my son Hassan know that the heart of a youth is like an uncultivated piece of land. Whatever you throw on it, it accepts. Therefore, I try to mold your heart before it hardened. So that you were able to learn from my examples and apply them to yours. And I think there are many fathers out there who need to have a bit more of a role as a friend with their uh, sons or daughters in being very open about discussing things which maybe their fathers weren't willing to be so open about. Times have changed. Lovely. Last question. Is there anything you recommend uh, that we can listen to to you know, give us the or remove sins uh, is there any sort of narrations to, to this mustahab to do this? And it's very beneficial to be listening to a certain du'a or a certain uh, audio piece. I think like I said, uh, the Qur'an is the cure. The Qur'an is a shifa for the sudur. 
And I think it's, there is nothing better to listen to in the life of a Muslim than the Holy Quran. Thank you very much, Doctor. Any final thoughts or anything from, uh, you want the viewer to take from this discussion? Just that, you know, as, as I said, a lot, uh, our physical senses have a bearing on our spirituality. And the two cannot be disconnected. So what we're going to hear, what we're going to see, let's remember that there is a major connection uh, to our spiritual growth. Yeah. Thank you very much Dr. for a very insightful Thank discussion. you so much. To all the viewers, thank you for joining us on this discussion on uh, the rights of hearing and the rights of seeing. Inshallah, we'll be having a show on the weekend on Friday to do with the rights of the hands and the rights of the feet. Inshallah, if the doctor will allow it to happen. Inshallah. And he will be here. See you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.